this is the way we do it. But like, I didn't, I didn't see it until I started coming back years later and start seeing sort of the, the, the Northeast thing. Um, and now I'm like mellowing out, you know, in traffic. Like when the temptation is just to be like, you know, I'm like, Go ahead. No, just kidding. I still have the Boston driver thing. That just that thing never left. But um, in any case, I came to faith. I um, I'll just say there are three things. This is sort of part of my testimony that I don't usually tell. The Lord at 19 brought three. And this the reason I'm telling you this is just to sort of bring in who I was without getting into it too much. Three little issues of crisis. Uh, that came into my life pretty dramatically, all within a, a real brief period. The first was, um, I was the quintessential 1980s loser um, that lived in his mother's, divorced mother's basement, um, you know, eating Hot Pockets and just throwing ninja stars into the wall and uh, angry at everyone. And um, I left you some Hot Pockets. So my mother's trying to, you know, get her life back and she's going to school and she's never around and... And um, I also was what um, we might call an entrepreneur. Um, so I was dealing drugs out of my mother's basement. <laughs> you guys didn't get that when I said entrepreneur. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing really big. Um, but I had this kid came to me, and he, um, he had gotten arrested, and he said, hey, uh, the cops offered me a plea uh, deal if I set you up. And uh, they really want you bad. And they either want you or this other guy, Mike, the heroin dealer, like the, like, you know, again, I'm 19. He's like this 45-year-old heroin biker guy. And I'm like, I'm as big as Mike? Whoa. Um, I had arrived. So... Um, <laughs> So what I, here's the thing though, up here in the, the um, People's Republic of Massachusetts, back then the law was such that if, if someone gets caught dealing drugs out of the house back then, even just marijuana, they would take the house. So here's my struggling mother now who's, you know, I, they, she got divorced when I was like 11, and it occurred to me that if it hadn't been for the honor of some drug addict that I don't even know, I could have lost my mother's house. And it, it you know, kind of pricked my conscience. So that was something that was weighing heavily on me. And second, um, it uh, interrupted my uh, cash flow. Or I really, I think I just dealt drugs just so I could just do drugs. And, um, but it kind of interrupted my, my life there. And then uh, second, it was really these were the two main things. I want to I be quick, is um, a very close friend of mine um, who had, he had got kicked out of his, his house when he was probably 15, 16, and had lived in my counterculture kingdom in my mother's basement um, with us for a couple of years. And so he was kind of like, had been my best friend at the time, but then he um, became like my brother because we lived together, which, you know, there's that sort of love-hate thing going after you live together for a few years. And um, he, so I was, uh, you know, and there's always... There's Pharisees everywhere, I always make this joke, that even among losers and drug addicts, there's kind of like this, thank thee, Father, that I am but a pot-smoking, acid-taking, occasional alcoholic. I am not like the crackheads. <laughs> thank thee, Father, that thou hast not made me like the lowly meth addict, you know, kind of thing. And, um, and so Mike was, you know, a crackhead, you know, all this kind of stuff, and I just use intellectual drugs. I like the psychoactive experience, you know. I'm not a speed freak, you know. Um, it's amazing how, you know, you think, oh, there's Pharisees in the church. No, there's Pharisees everywhere. It's called human pride, and it's pure deception. Um, but Mike was, you know, a bit more reckless, and um, so, I'm uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said his name, but... Um, we were supposed to go out one night, and uh, it was a Moody Blues concert. We used to, there was some concert venue. We used to go and jump the fence there was, anytime there was a band coming. And, um, and so he was supposed to come, and I was mad at him. 
I won't get into all the details, but he was late. And a friend of mine's father for years had been inviting me to a Bible study. And um, I was always like kind of open, like I'd been raised nominally Catholic. And, but I would say, yeah, someday I'm going to go to this Bible study. Well, he was late. And I go, you know something? Tonight's the night. After a few years, I'm going to go to that Bible study that uh, his name was Al Horky had been inviting me to. And so last minute, Mike was late, and I took off and went to the Bible study. And it was this, I went there with my, my dumb, uh, you know, drug girlfriend. <laughs> you can say that. And um, it was so funny because um, the whole message of this Bible study, I'd never been in a Bible study my whole life. And the Bible study was, it was very simple. This guy was a really good teacher. He was, he was had come out of sort of the faith movement, but he was actually a very balanced uh, guy, and he was teaching the difference between faith and hope. And he was like, faith is this, but hope is this. That was the whole, you know, faith is this, and he would explain, but hope is this. And at the end of the message, he said, okay, now, does anyone have any questions? And he, and he calls on my girlfriend. He says, okay, what was tonight? Uh, he goes, what is faith? And she goes, um, hope? <laughs> it was like... It was like, like you could not have given a more pothead answer. Um, and so, but here was the thing is, I actually felt the Holy Spirit that night. I had no idea what that was, but I was like, I don't know what this is, but I like it. As someone who was a connoisseur of experiences and sensations, I was like, I like the Holy Spirit and I want to come back. I had no grid. I just knew there was something there that I was drawn to. And I uh, went home and um, w- went to bed and I woke up, the phone rang, and it was another friend of mine, and Mike had got killed in a car wreck, had um, rolled his truck multiple times and uh, won't get into all the details there, but so, you know, someone very close to me was, was killed and, and sort of all of these things were happening about the same time. Then uh, it coincided with, I went with a friend, uh, we, we drove from uh, Massachusetts down to Memphis, ended up at this tent revival meeting, and uh, I actually, it was, we got there by accident, uh, and I actually got baptized, because it was August 20th, it was real hot, and, um, and literally we pulled up to this Piggly Wiggly, which is, a, which is a grocery store down south more and, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was real hot. We'd been on the road like 24 hours, Massachusetts to Memphis, no air conditioning. And, um, and we pull up to this grocery store, and there's a tent revival meeting. Well, I had no grid for Southern holiness tent revival culture. <laughs> but I was just like, this is better than going into a Taco Bell bathroom and like splashing in the sink. And I just said, let's find the preacher, and let's see if he'll baptize us. So we did. And uh, then they kind of, everyone kind of looked, they're like, who's this, you know, hippie guy, and let's get them roped into the, the meetings. And needless to say, that night, the Holy Spirit confronted me in a powerful way, but he was using some of the other events that were coming into my life, and I gave my life to the Lord that night in a very, I mean, the Lord confronted me in a powerful, powerful way. And essentially, he just said, the trajectory that your life is going right now, despite all of your... Uh, pride, is uh, you're on a path to, to the lake of fire. Very, if you don't give me your life tonight, you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. And I just said, yes, sir, you're right. And um, we wrestled for a while, and I gave my life to him. Well, um, so then I came back, and I was trying to find a good church, and this is a lot of this is to get to this, is that uh, the church that I finally settled on after and, and by the way, this is back in the days where you're looking for a church, I would just open the yellow pages. And um, when you just have no grid for Protestant culture and you just start, like, going to churches, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. <laughs> like, you'll, you know, and you have no grid for any of this. So, like, I would just show up on a Wednesday night to, like, I don't know, you know, the Church of God of Snakes and just be like, is you guys having a Bible study tonight? And they'd be like, there'd be four of them, like, come on in. So, um... But I ended up settling on the church that I went to the Bible study, which was an assembly of God in Brockton, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, probably a lot of you don't know, but so the pastor at the time was Robert Wise, who is he the district superintendent for New England or just the north? Southern New England. Okay. 
So um, he was the pastor of this just beautiful, old, super old Baptist church. So it was like this old, you know, 100 plus year old, beautiful Baptist church right in the heart of the really bad part of downtown Brockton, where Mike used to go to rip off crack dealers and, you know, kind of thing. And I ended up settling there. And um, so this was suddenly my new life. Now, here's what happened, because it was a real powerful conversion, is that what I discovered is that my friends, my drug friends, they didn't want to hang out with me anymore. Because all I wanted to do was talk about God and the Bible and Jesus. And, you know, it was just like, this is real. Like, and, and it was urgent, you know, like when you first get saved, like, no, you don't understand. People are going to hell. Like, this is real, you know. And they're just like, dude. Um, So what I used to do is on Saturdays, I would fill up my back pocket with New Testaments. You know, suddenly all my friends were, and I, you know, they just thought I completely flipped out. And I would go into Boston. I would take the T, which is the subway into Boston, and I would just walk around, look for anybody to talk to, just sort of, you know, I guess they call it a treasure hunt now. For me, it was more of just like a shotgun kind of thing, just anybody that, you know. Did you remember the movie The Apostle when... Um, What's his name? Anthony uh, Robert Duvall. He kind of gets out of the bus and he's like, which way are we going, Holy Spirit? Which way? Woo, we're going this way. You know, he's kind of, well, it's kind of like that, except, you know. And, um, and what I very quickly discovered as this new passionate believer who just fell in love with Jesus, who had just given his whole life to God, is that no one else wants to talk about the things that I want to talk about especially up in the sort of cold northeast, you know, where everyone's, don't talk to me about Jesus, I'm Catholic. Wait, what? Um, I'm sorry if you're Catholic, but, you know, it's just kind of, you would get that a lot, like, I don't, wait, but so you should be excited too. Um, but in general, as a rule, People don't want to talk about God, about, you know, don't talk to me about politics and religion. And very quickly, I then would bump into Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, they'll talk to you for a few minutes until they realize that you're resistant to their heretical mishmash potpourri of, of beliefs, their, their web of just mixed up, confused ideas, and then they'll sort of label you a goat. You know, they'll call the elders sort of thing. And I used to actually meet with Jehovah's Witnesses quite a bit back then. Again, anybody that would talk to me, <laughs> I wanted to talk about these things. And then it was shortly thereafter that I ran, I started bumping into Muslims. And what I discovered back then in the early days is that Muslims, unlike any other people, more so than Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it, Muslims love to talk about God and the Bible and Jesus and all of the things that I love to talk about, they like to talk about it. And I was like, who are these people? <laughs> now, they want to argue with us, and they are most often quite good at arguing with us. In fact, many of them are like Jehovah's Witnesses on steroids, <laughs> and they are often excited and even trained to argue with us about some of the most essential foundational things that we believe. You know, Jesus is the Son of God? No, Jesus didn't die on a cross. He's just a problem. You know, all of the things that are at the very foundation that we hold sacred, they're going to argue with those things, but they are very open to, you know, and sort of, the, so I grew up, again, in that area, mostly Portuguese family. So again, in the Midwest, people don't quite understand. And this is, this is the thing with my wife, because she's more laid back Midwest is um, Portuguese, Italian, you know, same kind of thing. I always joke to people, I go, you got to understand, the, the Northeast, we're like halfway to the Middle East in terms of culture. You know, like, you, like all the Portuguese aunts sitting around the table just kind of yelling over each other and talking and, and arguing, and then let's do it again next Sunday, you know. <laughs> and, and as a rule, not all, you know, Muslims are as different as people are different, but... Generally, that sort of Middle Eastern culture and that Eastern culture, they can sit down with you and argue about politics and religion and God and all of these things. 
and, you know, exchange a little spittle on each other's face and sort of thing. And at the end of the conversation, it's not like, ooh, this guy has a bad vibe. He's so Northeast, he's so Italian, he just likes to argue. It's like, okay, my friend, I enjoyed this. Will you be back next weekend? And I was like, who are these people? I love these people. Now, again, they're like my theological enemies, but they're my frenemies. You know, they're like my soulmates. They're like my, if I was a comic book character, they're like my, there's like this love-hate relationship. And I started falling in love with Muslims. We're, we're living at a time in history where the coldness that I experienced 20 plus years ago has only increased. People, people don't want to hear, especially nowadays with, you know, politics, like just... And yet there's a people throughout the earth that are some of the most God-conscious, God-hungry people in all of the earth, but yet they're looking for God in all the wrong places. And we are the people who are stewards of the message that have the words of life. And yet Satan is doing everything that he can to try to fill our hearts with fear, with bigotry, Sometimes it is racism. It's not all, well, what race is Islam? Okay, I understand that. But there is, um, Satan is using terrorism to try to fill us with the idea that every time you see a woman in a burqa or hijab, she obviously has a bomb under it, um, you know, sort of thing. And, and just like this, this fear tends to come over us. Now, I want to be clear. There are some legitimate concerns. Terrorism is very real. When you look at the history of Islam, when you look at current the spread of global radical Islam, there are some reasons to be concerned. You know, Uncle Joe that sends out the email that's all just negative, 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 he has some valid points. However, we are not people who are of this current age, of this current system. We are not first and foremost Republicans or Democrats or any of these other things of the world, we are followers of Jesus, first and foremost. That is who defines us. So we have an entirely different value system. And we have to recognize the fact that throughout history, throughout redemptive history, the Lord has always used incredible catastrophes natural disasters, man-made disasters, all sorts of terrible things that on the surface you go, this is terrible. But he's used it for his own glory and for his own redemptive purposes. And if we are people with eyes to see, who understand what the scriptures say, who understand this present hour, we need to recognize the opportunity, the tremendous moment of opportunity that's right in front of us. Now, very shortly after I came to faith, there was a missionary that had come to church and spoken. I believe at the time he was, he was an AG slash Wycliffe, because this is an AG sort of partner with Wycliffe. I might be wrong on that, but I think he was sort of with both um, Wycliffe Bible translators, and he was working in Kazakhstan. So, you know, all of the Istans, the southern former Istans below Russia that sort of broke off Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc., and he was working there, and he was working among Muslims, and he was working with the poorest of the poor. And he explained, for the first time in my life, this thing called the 1040 window. Well, this is just a part of the world that has the vast majority of peoples of the earth that have never heard the gospel or have no effective witness, a, a, a church or missionary presence in their midst, in order to hear an effective explanation of who Jesus is. This is where the vast majority of what we call unreached peoples live. So he explained the 1040 window, but then he explained that among all the peoples in the 1040 window, the most significant people who are yet to hear the gospel or don't have an effective witness, who are considered unreached, are Muslims. Are Muslims. So again, Muslims are not just in the Middle East. They're, you know, the, the most populous Muslim nations are Indonesia, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Like those four together make up two-thirds of the whole Islamic world. There's more Muslims today in Germany than there are in Lebanon. So, you know, sometimes we think it's all in the Middle East. Um, but nevertheless, the 1040 window sort of includes a lot of that. Well, you have today roughly 
you have 1.61, 1.62 billion Muslims. We have roughly 2.2 billion Christians. Now, again, this is Christian, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, you know. And so of that, you go, well, how many are born again? How many actually have the Holy Spirit who know God? And you, you quickly, the number kind of gets knocked at least in half. There's probably, let's say, about 800,000 people that would identify, 800 million, sorry, um, as born-again Christians. We have roughly twice the number of people in the earth that identify as Muslim than those that would call themselves born-again uh, Christians. Now, of that, of that group, 1.62, this is the world's second largest religion, and at present growth rates, and that's a combination of different factors, it will surpass Christianity in size right now, projected around 2050. So it will become the world's largest religion. Of this group, 46, uh, I'm sorry, um, it's 84.9%. Uh, so of the 1.6 billion, 85% roughly are considered unreached. Now what that means is of all of the unreached peoples in the world, 46% are Muslim. So all the peoples in the earth that don't have an effective gospel witness, close to half of them are Muslim. This is what this missionary said. He said, and at that time, again, this was 91-2, he said, we were sending roughly half of 1% of our missionaries to the Islamic world. Half of the unreached peoples of the earth, and we're sending half of 1%. So of every 100 missionaries, of every 200 missionaries, one was going to the Islamic world. The greatest number that needs to hear the gospel, and we're sending the least number of our missionaries. And at the end of the message, he gave an altar call, and he said, if there's anybody here that would like to come to the altar and commit your life to the Islamic world, just in typical Pentecostal altar call form. If you feel that call, I'd like you to come forward. And I was the only one in the church that walked up and knelt down. And it was very sincere. And it was also very pragmatic. I mean, I felt the call, but it was real simple. It was just, I said, Lord, I should be dead right now. I should be in hell right now. But you opened my eyes, not because I deserved it, not because I was the best of all of the losers. The Lord didn't look down and be like, man, I really have got a lot to accomplish. I need this guy. He was like, I'm going to have mercy on this pathetic, little, arrogant, drug-dealing loser, this little vandal, you know, kind of just dirt bag. I'm going to have mercy on him. And he opened my eyes and shocked me, really. You know, he brought crisis into my life because he loves me, because that's what a father does to his children. That's what a father does to, a, to his, his children. He opened my eyes, and he laid on my heart for the first time a, a, his cry, his heart for the Islamic world. So I began my sort of five-year uh, plan. The idea was I was going to go to a little Bible school out in the Midwest. I was going to study the scriptures and sort of get the Holy Spirit, and then I was going to go up to a missions college up in Minneapolis and go to the Middle East. That was the plan. Well, we make our plans, but the Lord has other plans. And uh, in the process of all this, I, I did spend most of 94 in Israel, Egypt, Jordan, sort of bouncing around. Won't get into all the details of that, but came back. I uh, was going to school because, well, essentially... <laughs> I went to Israel, I was supposed to be there for a few weeks, I ended up staying for most of the year, but well, how do you survive? Um, well, obviously you do what anybody does, is I basically rented my body out um, to an Israeli construction company <laughs> down in uh, Elat, and I would save up money, sleep on the ground at this cheap Christian youth hostel, and then when I had enough money, I would bounce and go see Egypt for a couple weeks, this sort of thing. And so after doing that, which is, you know, so like 44 degrees Celsius, which is like something like 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 12-hour day, six days a week, making about three bucks an hour, I realized, you know, maybe I ought to get a degree other than theology. 
And so I came back to uh, the Midwest. I started pursuing a degree in engineering. I was gonna, I'm gonna get this, then I'll do, get finished my missions degree. But then in the middle of that, met my wife. So life happens. Next thing you know, you know, you, you, you go from like being single, like, Lord, how long? And then all of a sudden, you, you're like married with a baby. It's like, like, whoa, what just happened? And um, life happens, so I won't get into all that. But um, the Lord, what, what was happening in the midst of all this is, is I can step back and I can see that the Lord calls the foolish things of the world, the, that which is despised, that which is not deserving in order to display his glory, in order to display his mercy. But he was sovereignly preparing me for the hour that we are in right now. And the invitation tonight is for those that have ears to hear, to hear the moment that we're in, to hear the moment of opportunity, to hear the cry of the Father. Now, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, this is what we call the Great Commission. Very, very simple. Jesus came up and he spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So this parting commandment, that the glorified, resurrected Jesus gave to all of us through the disciples, by extension to all of us, is go into all of the nations. Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Baptize them. Expand my kingdom. Expand my family. You know, preach this good news to all of the nations. Now, he goes, guys, go do this. This is what I need you. This is what you're called to do. This is your mandate, right? That's the Great Commission. In Matthew 24, verse 14, I have, uh, there's a verse here, I call it the Great Commission Prophecy. Now, this is part of Jesus' Sermon on the End Times, often just referred to as the Olivet Discourse, because Jesus was on the Mount of Olives. And he's giving the sermon about the last days, and he lays out all these different details, and he says this. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom, this good news of this coming kingdom that will be established on the earth, whereby wickedness will be abolished, whereby human trafficking will come to an end, where abortion will be a thing of the past, where sickness and disease will no longer be an issue, where aging and dying will be a thing of the past, where corrupt politicians will no longer govern the nations, where the Son of God will be on the throne, on the throne of David in Jerusalem. That's the good news, and it's coming. He says, in this gospel, this good news will be proclaimed and preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So he gave us the Great Commission. He says, guys, go preach the good news. Baptize them into the community. Teach them all of these things. But there's also the prophecy where he said, this is going to happen. This this proclamation throughout the nations will be accomplished. Now, the question of this hour, did you see what I just did? That's the picture that always ends up on YouTube. Uh, it's the Italian in me. It's, I'm not part of the Illuminati. I'm, I'm slowly becoming more conscious. Watch your hand gestures. <clears throat> It's true. They like take pictures and they're like, Joel works for the Illuminati. And I'm always like, show me the Illuminati money. Just kidding. My wife's like, where's all the Illuminati money? So um, Jesus made it clear that this is going to happen. The question is, who is going to accomplish it? Are we going to be part of it? If the Western church is going to be part of completing the Great Commission, now listen, this is very simple logic, among the 1.6 billion, so if you take 85% of the Islamic world, that's about 1.25 billion, unreached right now, 1.25 billion, unreached. If that's going to be accomplished, we, are not, we will not be able to accomplish it if we live according to the mindset of this current age. If we live according to the the, um, what would be just normal, you know, intuition, common sense. They want to kill me. 
because I've seen it in the news, therefore that's not where I'm going to move. That's pretty common sense wisdom. Being a follower of Jesus in many, many ways, it's not to say that you throw common sense out the window, but you do throw the value system of this current age out the window. You crucify it. Because, look, this is who Jesus is. He's the very essence of God in the flesh. He's, it's God's very heart. He, the one who made the universe, the one who made everything. He sent his very heart into the earth to take on flesh. It says in Philippians 2 that he didn't consider his equality with God. He had every right to say, hey, look, I'm God. He didn't consider equality with God something to be demanded, seized, grasped in any way, shape, or form. He didn't say, hey, I paid for first class. No, he put himself at the very back by the toilets, <laughs> not even by the engine. He put, his, he put himself at the back. He put himself at the bottom, and he humbled himself, and he allowed himself to be mutilated for his enemies. Because all of us, every single one of us in this room, before the Lord opened our eyes, whether some of you were raised Christian, but regardless, all of us are families. If we're not Jewish, if we don't you know, have believing family all the way back, all of us were pagans at one time. Amen. And every single one of us in this room, whether we like it or not, if we got what we deserved, would spend eternity in the lake of fire. He didn't save a single one of us because we deserved it, because we were better. He saved us out of his mercy. And this is the essence of why Jesus came, to reveal the very heart of the Father, to make atonement in order that we could inherit all of the good things that he desires to give to his creation for free, by grace. And we love him back. We do. We're obedient out of love, not because we're trying to earn eternal bliss. Because trust me, guys, you can't earn it. You know, it's like if I show up and I'm like, hey, everybody, you know, I'm not Oprah Winfrey. Reach under your seat. Free Maserati to everyone. And then everyone comes up and's like, well, I'm kind of broke, but at least here's $10. I'm like, no, it's a gift. You can't pay for eternal bliss with your little pathetic good deeds. None of us can. It is by mercy. It is by grace, period. So we go... But Muslims, but Muslim, I mean, look at what they're doing. I mean, have you seen ISIS videos? Have you seen all of the jihadis and all of this kind of thing? And I go, yeah, there's some really evil, vile stuff out there in the earth. Do you guys hear the story, by the way, of the, um, the uh, Jewish uh, Pharisee, basically, in, in Jerusalem? Um, there was a Messianic Jew. So he was a Jew who believes in, in Jesus. And he was uh, just this young guy, I mean, just anointed. And the, the Pharisees um, were furious because he was preaching the gospel. And they literally stoned him to death in Jerusalem. I mean, just crushed his body with stones. And this one particular guy that was standing there when he, they were doing it was holding the cloaks of the other men who were doing it. His name was Saul, and the Lord used him to write much of the New Testament. He was murdering some of the best and brightest, glowing-faced, young messianic believers. That's who the Lord called to write epistles that is sacred scripture. So I'm not trying to make you fall in love with ISIS, but I am saying... There is an opportunity right now for us to walk with the value system, to see beyond the surface of what Satan, because this is what terrorism does. You see people get killed at some Christian festival in Berlin. You see the, you know, all of the stuff, and that stuff's real. But then Satan uses that to cause us not to obey Jesus not to obey the Great Commission, to say, I'm only going to preach to people that I'm not scared of or that I like. Now, you live here right on the edge of New York City. I guarantee you, every single one in this room has Muslims right in your midst, right, living all around you. And again, I want to be clear, the vast majority of Muslims are nothing like ISIS. Some of them might be, <laughs> but the vast majority are not. I want to be realistic. 
There are some, you know, there's a percentage. They say roughly 15% global Muslims are open to using violence and so to forward their religion. Because if you study the earliest example of their prophet Muhammad, you study the Quran, you study their earliest sacred traditions, you study the life of the successors of Muhammad, known as the rightly guided successors, um, it's a lot like ISIS. But the average Muslim is very Quranically illiterate, much more so than the average churchgoer is biblically illiterate. And that's saying quite a lot. Because they don't really study the Quran like we have, like, they don't have like, hey, Wednesday night Quran study. They learn how to recite it in Arabic, and most of them don't speak Arabic, because most of the Muslim world is not Arab speaking, is not, doesn't speak Arabic. So I want to be very clear that the vast majority of Muslims are not radical, but you know something? The Lord wants to save the radicals too. He wants to save your neighbors, that is the, the doctor and the you know, car salesman and the cop and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But he also wants to get the Christian killers because it's not according to what we deserve. Now, look at this. This is um, kind of sort of the other side of the coin, if you will. I call this the other great commission. Revelation 6, verse 9 through 10. Because we always talk in the missions movement, well, we're going to preach the gospel to all the world, and then we'll complete the Great Commission. Jesus will return, because that has to be done first, right? And missiologists are always calculating how close we are. We're getting real close. But this is the sort of other thing that has to be completed that no one talks about. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar of the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained, they had held firm. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood uh, and those who dwell on the earth? And there was given each of them a white robe. They were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants and their brethren were to be killed even as they had been, would be completed also. So the Bible says that the gospel will be preached to all of the unreached, and then he'll return. And he also says that he's not going to return until the full number are martyred. The full number of martyrs comes in. Now, here's the thing. The completion of the Great Commission and the full number of martyrs are not two separate things. They are one and the same. So the question is, are we going to sit back and go, thanks a lot, Joel. Scary message. Um, I'm just going to let my Middle Eastern friends do it. I'm just going to read books on how I can be victorious in Jesus. Because that sells a lot better and it's a lot funner. And there's truth in it, don't get me wrong, but that's the kind of stuff that we love to focus on. But today we don't like to talk about Christianity 101, which is imitation of Jesus. Embracing the cross, putting the gospel first. I'm not putting anybody down. I'm just saying in terms of the buffet of wonderful things that we can pull out of his word, there's part of the buffet that we generally tend to ignore. If we are going to fulfill the Great Commission, which Jesus said we will, we're going to have to start getting back to the gospel getting back to the imitation of Jesus, getting back to what it means to actually be a Christian. And Lord, let us be part of it. Yeah. I don't just want the emerging Brazilian missionary movement to be the only ones that do it. And those crazy Chinese, I want to be part of it. I want the Western church to be first and forefront. I mean, like right now, look, I want to be clear. You know, we've just gone through a crazy storm of political stuff with the elections and everyone hates each other and we're still trying to figure out who we should unblock and all this kind of stuff. And, and there's a lot of feelings. Now, I'll just say this. Um, you know, I'm raising my children in the, the United States and despite the fact that I'm this kind of weird hybrid mixture of all kinds of ethnicities and... Um, and I'm convinced that I've got some dachshund in me, um, which is another part of the whole government breeding thing, but and we won't get into that, um, is I, I love this country. I love the country that I'm in right now. And, you know, there's, I travel all over the world, and I love a lot of places. But this is 
the place that the Lord has planted me and where I'm raising my family. And although we as a nation have quite often fell dramatically short of the principles that are in our founding documents, principles such as freedom, equality, civil liberties, all of these things, even though we've fallen short over and over and over again, we still have these principles as something that as a people we are fighting for still to this day and, and pushing toward, right? We're pushing for all of these things. Um, there's a lot of people that just, they're so angry with the political climate, they're just like, Lord, just like Jeremiah, I'm done with this mess. Bring your judgment. <laughs> you know, like you get all these like zealous Christians and they're like, if the Lord doesn't judge America, he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. You kind of like, well, aren't we righteous? Um, and look, I, I, I understand at times, you know, you wake up in the morning and you turn on the news, you know, this is turning on the news. Um, and you're like, oh, oh, you know, I understand that. But here's the thing is we are called to be a house of prayer for all nations. And that's not just for other nations. We're called to be a people of prayer who aren't just seating. Now, here's one thing. The United States, for all of its shortcomings, we are still funding 80% of the global missionaries going out throughout all the earth. We are still accounting for 80% of the missionaries going out to the We're still at 80%. Like I said, the Chinese, the Koreans, the Brazilians are emerging as great missionary sending nations. But despite any problems that any of us might have, this is still something that I am convinced the Lord wants to use. And we need to be people to say, Father, give to this nation a spirit of repentance. Let a genuine revival sweep throughout our nation. Let this city, let this state, let this region be a, a hot spot of the Holy Spirit. Let your gospel go forth. Let this be a missionary sending hub throughout the nations. And let us not begin decreasing in the number that we're sending, but let us increase, right? We're called, all of us. Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. This, we are called to be a house of prayer for all nations. Now, there is another house of prayer in the earth, and that's the Islamic house of prayer. And believe me, they're praying an awful lot. They're praying to the God they don't know, and they can't know because he's unknowable. But Muslims pray an awful lot. In fact, I always like to ask the question, I go, guys, if you lead a Muslim to the Lord, and he comes to faith, and he begins, he begins imitating your prayer life, is he going to start praying more or less? And when you have a people who are a people of prayer, if they want to convert to truth, they want to find something. Doesn't, this is not a religious trip because it's not about ours. But they want to see a people who are a genuine house of prayer. So one of the first steps that we need, if we are going to accomplish that which Jesus wanted us to accomplish, is we need to be a people of prayer. We need to be a community of prayer. We're not going to, look, there's not some magic button that when we approach the last day, suddenly we're all just going to agree on politics. It's not going to happen. It's going to get worse. But we can, say, we can say, look, you have your family background. You have your story. You have your articles that you read on the internet. You have the, your things that you believe. I have mine. We may disagree, but I have absolute grace and understanding for where you're at, for where I'm at. But here's what we can agree on. We are followers of Jesus. Because, again, this, this whole, the, the spirit of the world is just getting in the way in so many different ways. If we put the imitation of Jesus, following Jesus, embracing the cross, proclaiming the gospel, this is what's first and foremost. Giving ourselves to becoming a house of prayer and learning what it means to love those that even... The, the spirit of the world says, why would you? It doesn't make sense. Luke 24, verse 26. The American gospel essentially says this. You have the cross, and then you have this age, and you have the end times, the return of Jesus, and the age to come. The American gospel often says something like this. Glory now, glory in the age to come. I call that you can have your cake and eat it too gospel. Sounds great. Your best life now. 
That sounds fantastic. In my opinion, the biblical gospel is this. Jesus died on the cross. In this current age, we embrace the cross. He returns. We inherit glory. In this age, we'll be blessed. I mean, look, life's going to be a lot better if you're not a drug addict. But Paul said, if we're actually following Jesus and it's not real, we of all people are to be pitied. Why? Why would we be pitied? If we're living our best life now, why would we be pitied? Because if it's not true, we are making tremendous sacrifices for nothing. It doesn't make any sense if we're to be pitied now. So the biblical gospel is cross now. This age is cruciform. It is modeled after the cross. It's patterned after the life of Jesus. Luke 24, verse 26. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter glory? 1 Peter 2, verse 21, to this we were called, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that we should follow in his steps. He has given us the pattern. He has shown us what it means to imitate, to, to exemplify the heart of the Father. We are called to imitate him, and then we will inherit the glories of the age to come. And, and the biblical gospel is not primarily your best life now. It is your best life in the age to come. And when we fix our eyes on the age to come, when we fix our eyes on the glory and the beauty of the age to come, then we can lay down our lives now because we have confidence in the resurrection of the dead, of the age to come, and the beauty of the kingdom that all of the prophets are talking about. Listen, we often, we preach this gospel and it's very vague. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That, you know, and it, it's kind of like Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that someday you die and you don't go to hell. You're like, well, cool. I didn't want to go to hell. What's heaven like? And they're like, it's going to be great. You're like, I need some more detail. And they're like, you're going to worship God forever. You know, and you, know, you go, that's good. But you know something? The prophets give us tremendous detail. And we're like, Just, we have this vague, like, disembodied idea floating in the cloud. No, he comes back. Jesus died on the cross to redeem all of creation, things above and below. He's going to redeem the trees and the earth and the planet and our bodies, and we will be clothed in immortality, in flesh and and bone. I don't understand. Paul goes, look, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but we're going to be like him. He ate food. We get to keep eating stuff. You know, like, amen, woo, like, and we don't gain weight. We need to talk more about the age to come because that's our inheritance, and that, those are the things that allow us to lay down our life now and to lay down our lives just like he did, even for our enemies, according to the, according to the natural, according to this current age, right? I was just with some friends. We're going to wrap it up here. Um, we'll pray in a few minutes. They'll, they're going to release the children soon. And we'll take a, a few minutes to pray. And then we'll do some q and I was just with some friends who are um, working in northern Iraq in, in the city of Erbil. And um, they were in the camps, the refugee camps, as all these people were displaced. They're in all these just massive camps living in um, sort of tents as well as these little trailers that the UN sends over. And, and um, the UN does a few things, right? Um, and uh, there was a woman, and she'd come out of Mosul. So again, Mosul is ancient Nineveh, basically. But this is the city, which is primarily Sunni Muslims, so Sunnis are the majority sect. But they basically welcomed ISIS, not because they're totally pro-ISIS, but because they thought this would help protect them from the barbarity of the, Sun- of the Shia that controlled Iraq since we handed it over to the Shia, but we won't get into politics. So, um, and so, you know, you go, so these are the people that basically received ISIS. Yeah. So this woman is in the camp, and she's in her full black burqa. So the burqa is like, you know, the full sleeping bag. Um, the, the, the hijab is just just the head covering. That's a hijab, right? So full, you know, and when we do films, uh, when we're out, you know, because you always want that iconic picture of the woman in the full burqa. And uh, so the code is ninjas. 
Anyway, I know, it's stupid. But so um, that's to the camera guy. Hey, ninjas, get, get, get him. <laughs> um, so here comes a woman in the full black burqa. And, um, and I forgot part of the story, so forgive me. But um, <laughs> I'm supposed to know a story before I tell it. But so basically, <laughs> this young American missionary is there. And she starts talking. And the woman sort of asked her, like, well, why are you here? And she said, I'm here because of Jesus. And she goes, Jesus, I know him. I know him. Which reminds me of Elf. Santa, I, I know him. <laughs> I love that part. Um, everybody loves Elf. <clears throat> and she goes, you know him. We need to talk. You've just come out of Mosul. Like, you're a Muslim, obviously. And so she tells the story of how she was with some other women, and I forget the full story exactly, but uh, there was, you know, an airstrike, and they all got burnt really bad. In fact, I think the other ones all died. She was severely burnt. And in her, in her pain, she went into a vision, had sort of a vision, and she saw a man you know, white robes and glowing presence, and he was coming, and I forget exactly again, but they said, this is Jesus. And she said, oh, I want him to pray for me. But he just walked by her, and just the hem of his garment went over her and just touched her. And she got crazy healed, like, you know, back from death. And she basically, you know, is like, I, you know, I love Jesus kind of thing. And so now she bumps into this missionary, and she says, um, and she says kind of like, so can you explain to me what this means? That was it. And she's like, you want me to explain to you what that means? Sure. Um, and so now the woman has been coming regularly, consistently to the Bible studies. And I might be wrong, but I think they said she got baptized. Like, how many of you guys are jealous? I had some... I got led to the Lord by this tent revival preacher who took like eight offerings a night. Um, like... I'm jealous of that Muslim lady. Like, Jesus actually personally appeared to her. I work with uh, one of the largest underground networks in Iran, and, that's underground church networks, and um, there's a story where a good friend of mine, close, personal, dear friend, and pray for them right now because they're, uh, they're going through some severe spiritual attack. His wife is really sick, severe, like, fibromyalgia stuff. And, um, but he heard about a new believer uh, way out in this rural area. He's like, how did this guy become a believer, a follower of Jesus? Because there's no house churches out there. It's like way out. There's no churches. And, but everyone's like, but this guy's on fire. Like, so he goes, we have to go out and check it out. So it's a couple hours out, and they drive out. And he goes, it was just like, I had never seen anybody so poor. You know, just like literally like a little tiny, almost like, you know, in Iran, but almost like a mud hut type of thing with nothing, no possessions, just slept on the dirt. And he comes in, he starts talking to him, and he you know, welcomes him in, and he's, he's like talking the talk. And he goes, so how did you become a follower of Jesus? And he goes, I just believed what the man told me. He goes, well, what man? He goes, well, this man came to my door for 40 nights straight. And uh, he would come, I would go to bed, and I would wake up, he would knock on the door, and, you know, you know, Middle Eastern guy, longer hair, beard, powerful presence, white robe, and he would knock on the door, and he would come in, and he would say, I want you to write down everything that I tell you. And he goes, so I wrote it down. And he goes, S what did you write down? And he goes, can I see it? And he goes, sure. And he gets just this little notebook, and it's all in Farsi, Persian, and he opens it up, and he looks, and just in hand handwritten, it says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He says the entire gospel of John verbatim in Farsi. And he goes, I just believe what the guy told me. <laughs> Follower of Jesus. I'm jealous. Like, Jesus <laughs> led. Like, how'd you come to the Lord? Oh, well, you know, Jesus came and dictated the Gospel of John to me personally. <laughs> I was in Egypt. This is uh, four year, uh, 2013, so uh, three, th th four, four years ago. 13 plus 4 is 17. And um, I just got there. I've told the story a million times, but th this just happened when the week that I was there, I didn't get to talk to the girl, but the whole community was so excited. And uh, this young Christian um, girl had gotten into a taxi, and the taxi driver was a Salafi. So the Salafis are the radical sort of 
Saudi influence, like ISIS, basically. And um, that type of sect, you know, with the sort of uh, Mennonite beard and the, you know, kind of deal. What I mean is no mustache. With the, and, um, and she's in the taxi with this Salafi, you know, this fairly radical Muslim, and the Lord prompts her, and he says, Jesus says, I want you to tell him that I love him. She's like, what are you, crazy? You know, like, you know, it's like Jesus prompts you to do something. For me, it's always something like it's weird. I'm like, that's not Jesus. That's weird. And, um, and so she starts arguing with Jesus, you know. I'm not going to. I'll just tell him God loves him. You know, Allah loves you. And, you know, I want you to tell him Yeshua. That's in Arabic, Yeshua. Not Isa. That's the Quranic. Yeshua is how the Arab Christians say Jesus. And uh, Yeshua. And so... Um, Tell him that I love him. She goes, okay, he'll kidnap me. Like, this is not a good idea. So she says, I'm going to change. I'm going to tell him to take me to a different location, a very crowded area. And she says, I'm going to get out of the car first, <laughs> hand him the money, and then I'll tell him. Deal? Jesus like, deal. <laughs> Jesus makes deals. He does. As long as, as long as it ends in obedience, he's all right. And... Uh, so she does that. She gets to this location. She gets up. She gives the money. And she says, Yeshua loves you. And he said, what did you just say? <laughs> Yeshua loves you. And he said, I need to talk to you. And he said, for the past few weeks, I've been having dreams where initially he said, Isa, which is the chronic fake name for Jesus. He goes, he's been appearing to me. But he's been, he was telling me all these things in dreams that go against the Quran. He goes, so I just figured they're just dreams. Like, he goes, but last night he appeared and very, I mean, very like powerfully looked at me and he said, so that you will know that it is I who have been speaking to you. Tomorrow a young Christian girl will get into the taxi. She'll have you take you to the location. She'll get out of the taxi. She'll give you the money and she'll tell you that I love you. And I'm always very, very leery of uh, evangelistic exaggerations and stuff. So I confirmed with my friends, and they go, yeah, he's been baptized. He's part of the community. He's now joined the church. You know, this is. <clears throat> what this says to me is that Jesus loves Muslims. There are many, many, many Muslims. Their prayer, when they begin praying, is they say, oh, Allah, guide me to the straight path, sort of like on the straight and narrow, let me not go astray, not like, it's essentially kind of like, don't let me go astray like the Christians. You know, they don't say that, but not like those who went astray or like those who are corrupt, the Jews. Um, that's kind of the inference, but, but guide me in the straight path. And people say, well, when Muslims pray, does God hear their prayers? Are they praying to God? And the answer is yes and no, because there's only one God but they're praying to the God that even they don't believe they can truly know. But of course God hears the prayers of those who are praying to the God they can't know in ignorance. And there are many that are sincere. And when someone truly cries out to the God of creation and says, guide me to the straight path, he's, the Lord is looking. For, because look, he doesn't, he, he will do these supernatural things. But he always brings someone along then to disciple them and teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. You know this famous statement by the supposedly Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. That's so unbiblical. You can't teach someone to obey all that I, you can't teach, explain to someone the concept of blood atonement with giving them coffee, you know, water, whatever, you know, like that just doesn't work. You can open their heart to those things, but we are called to teach and, 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 and uh, disciple them into some pretty detailed doctrines and ideas. So 99% of the Muslims that are coming to faith, and there are more Muslims coming to faith all over the world right now than any time in human history, they are coming to faith because a Christian had the boldness to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, and I'm going to open my mouth and share the gospel. Now, there's a lot of the miraculous stuff, and we love that stuff, and that's proof to me that God loves Muslims. But he always sends a preacher. How will they hear unless there's a preacher? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, right? Let's pray. 
<clears throat> Father, we come before you in this hour. We know based on what you're doing in the earth right now, based on what you said, what you said is going to happen in your word, we know that there will be a mighty ingathering. There will be a harvest throughout the Islamic world. My spirit leapt when I, I, I didn't even realize the name of the church is harvest time. Father, we want to be part of your great end time harvest. Father, we say, we, peering into your word, we say, indeed, it's harvest time. Lord, we ask that as individuals, that as a house, as a community, we would be part of this amazing opportunity. Everything in the natural is going to tell us no. Everything in the natural is going to tell us that doesn't make sense, it's irresponsible, it's foolish, it's suicidal, etc., etc., etc. They don't deserve it. The only thing that will remedy the chaos of the Middle East is military action or this, that, or the other thing. Father, we say, let us be people after your son. Let us be people of the cross. Lord, we want to follow your son wherever he goes. When those around us reject the gospel and put up barriers, we kick off the dust off our feet and move on to those that are willing to listen and willing to hear. Father, we ask that you would empower us, that you would burn into our hearts a desire to be your ambassadors. We have the most beautiful, amazing, uh, logical, emotionally appealing, just magnificent message that mankind has ever known. Fill us with an excitement to share it with everyone that we can, everyone that will listen. Give us eyes to see, like, like I joked at the beginning, the ability to follow your Holy Spirit this way or that way. Open our eyes that we could see the treasure all around us. Let us not miss the opportunity. We want to be part of your harvest. We want to partner with you in what you're doing. I ask, Father, for this house that you would raise up, that you would raise up a work out of this community, even as the expansion of the sanctuary blows up, it just, you know, just multiplies tremendously. Likewise, Father, let the gospel going forth out of this community blow up. Let this, in the, in the supernatural, in the spirit, let this be a hot spot, a... a um, uh, a, a blaze, an inferno of your activity, sending out sparks throughout the nations and catching fire all over the nations. Jesus, we ask that you would open our eyes to see you for who you are. We ask that you would give us grace to follow you, to die afresh even as we did on that day when we gave you our lives. We ask that you would give us the ability to take up the cross daily fixing our eyes on the joy set before us, fixing our eyes on the beauty and the glories of the age to come. We want to bring as many with us as possible. Father, do for them what you did for us. Use us in these last days. We thank you for all of these things. We commit them to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So feel free to leave, feel free to get your children, but I think what we'll do is just do Q&A uh, for another 15, 20 minutes. Okay, oh, yeah. and Nick will grab the mic so that no one has to yell. So <clears throat> we didn't, you know, um, touch on... If you look at the titles of my books, I teach on the end times and a lot of those different things, and it's kind of what I'm often known for. Um, the focus tonight, obviously, was just pretty straightforward on the gospel. But uh, if anyone has a question, if not, no problem. Um, do you want to do you want to like run a mic to someone instead of so they don't have to necessarily? Might be easier. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Joel. Uh, you can hear me, right? Well, thank you, Joel. Thank you for the encouraging message. Um, you must have met Muslims who have been converted and have become followers of Jesus, and, and I'm one of them. All right. And I... <laughs> And I have this strong desire to uh, witness to my family. Fortunately, they're cordial with me, and we sit down together, we have meals together, and they have accepted me. I, uh, you know exactly what happens you know, to a Muslim you know, or convert in a family like that. In, in, Where are you from, some, I'm from originally? Families. Pakistan? Pakistan, right. Okay. My name is Rafiq. Rafiq. So I think the usual question that comes up with uh, Muslim is uh, Jesus being son of God. Yeah. And they call it, like, as, as soon as I begin to preach to my family, they say, you are committing shirk. Shirk. And, you know, then the hell and all the, everything breaks loose. So, I mean, I have some answers. And also, when it comes to crucifixion and resurrection, I can answer that better than the first question, like, who is son of, son of God? Because you can historically prove crucifixion or, and even resurrection you know, through the witnesses in the Bible and all that. But this question creates an obstacle because they think like you've made a man into God and son of God. So since you have so much experience, what answer you usually Okay, so essentially what Rafiq is asking is this is a huge stumbling block for Muslims, uh, Jesus as the Son of God. Now, again, we often think of these terms through our religious lingo. We go, Jesus is the Son of God. I affirm that doctrine, you know, but kind of what does it mean? I always like to, like, pick it apart. What does that mean? Again, throughout the Bible, God is constantly revealing himself to man. He reveals himself to Hagar, the mother of Ishmael. And she goes, I have seen the one who sees me. You know, he wrestles with Jacob. And he appears as in the form of an angel called the angel of the Lord. But it's not just an angel. It's actually called God. And you have all of these examples where God is appearing. God is revealing in the, in the fire to, to uh, the burning bush. And this kind of thing because, so, so first of all, I'm, gonna, I'm dealing with the apologetic side of it. The logical explanation is if God is truly good. Okay, so let me just do this. Muslims believe that God is almighty, that he is great, he is transcendent, he's big. I mean, come on, guys, he made the universe. He's God. We can't wrap our heads around him. He's big, he's other than. Don't compare him to something on earth. No, don't call him a father. Don't say he has a son. You're lowering him. That's blasphemy. Shirk is the term they use, which is the greatest form of blasphemy, associating partners with God, lowering God. That's blasphemy. That's what Muslims would say. Now, we agree with Muslims on everything but the blasphemy. We go, yeah, God is great. God is almighty. He's transcendent. He's unknowable. The scriptures say no man has ever seen God. He lives in unapproachable light. We can't wrap our head around the one that made the universe. We can't even wrap our head around the stars or the sun. We call that God the Father. But God the Father is also good. And if he's good, it means that he is going to share himself, reveal himself to us, his, his creation. How does he do that? How is that possible? Because you can't just send a book down. By the way, he revealed a book. The fact even that he would send a book proves that he has somehow lowered himself. Now, they will never admit that. But how does he share himself? What's better, to send a letter or to show up in person? Now, he's been revealing himself throughout the biblical history. This is the essence of who God is. I have seen the one... Oh. He, he, the Lord says, I have heard your misery, he says to Hagar. I'm the one that condescends to hear. God, this God that's unknowable, that's beyond us in and of himself, he hears our misery. He actually hears us when we're laying in bed crying. Um, you know, this is the essence of who God is. Well, his ultimate revelation came in the form of the Messiah. 
as it was always prophesied that he would. Now, the Bible uses the term the son of God. Well, it's not literally a son, like, because God didn't sleep with Mary. Muslims will be like, God slept with Mary, that's blasphemy. No, we don't believe that. But the term son, essentially, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy. You could say God sent his heart into the earth. You could say God sent his essence into the earth. The point is that Jesus is the ultimate self-revelation of God. God's revealing himself to us. Why? Because he's good. Because he loves us. It's very simple. If he doesn't reveal himself, it's proof that he doesn't really love us. And that message is a million times more superior to the idea that God wouldn't do that. Muslims say, God couldn't do that. You go, don't tell me God can't do that. So I always use, I call it this tale of two fathers. Um, One father comes home from work, and he's exhausted, and his kids are like, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. And he's like, ugh. And, um, and so, you know, I've got five kids, and so the, the kids are like, Daddy, you know, you play with me, play Barbies. And um, because guys are always like, hey, man, what are you doing this week? I want to get together. I don't know what, I was thinking maybe play Barbies. Like, that's not what we do. But your kids, you love your kids, so you get down on the, on the rug, and, you know, you're like, Ugh. and you're like, somebody dress these things. This is awkward. You know, it's like at my house, I've got these naked Barbies, and they're all chewed up by the dogs. Um, and, you know, you play with dolls. Well, I don't like playing with dolls, if I'm to be honest with you, but I love my kids. I don't mind humiliating, and the kids are over there like, Snapchat, um, the teens. I don't mind humiliating myself because that's what a father does. Now, this other father comes home from work, and his kids say, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy, play with me. And he goes, nay, it is, it is not befitting the dignity of, don't you know who I am? I don't play with dolls. Play with your siblings. Simple story, two human fathers. Now, the truth is, the God of the Quran, he doesn't even come home. He's the father that is out there, supposedly somewhere, but you, the kids never even see him. Now, between the two fathers, which one do you want to be your father? Everyone in the room is going to say the one that loves his kids. Well, that's the difference between the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran. The God of the Quran is all about, no, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. Allahu Akbar, God is greater, Allah is greater. He's an insecure, pathetic imposter. The God of the Bible is not worried about protecting his greatness. You can't diminish the greatness of God. His greatness is demonstrated in his humility. This is the, this is the message that we're ambassadors of. Now, that said, that said, we have the best arguments. We have the best message. But most often, we won't win them through arguments. We will win them by love and by prayer and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the few basic things, if you have, you know, you're in this situation, constantly be asking them, what can I pray for you? How can I pray for you? Um, If something's going on, they're sick, can I pray for you? Believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he does. Let him do what he does. Lay hands on him, pray for him. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. If they are willing to take it, give him a Bible. Nice gift edition, right? Give him a Bible. And just keep loving on them. And if they're willing to listen, make the arguments. But usually it's not the argument. Now, sometimes the arguments work. But usually it's the the love has to open the door. And don't anyone go, I haven't been trained. I don't have all the answers. So therefore, I need to get trained before I start. No, reach out to Muslims. And after they steamroll you with their arguments, if you have pride, you're going to go learn the arguments. You're going to be like, I'm not going to let that happen again. (laughs) Don't, don't wait until you're trained. Go out and do it. Love them. 85% of Muslims that come to faith say the main thing that is because a Christian loved them. Because we are called to be a people of the cross, which is we love people unconditionally. Is there another one? I hope that was helpful, Rafiq. Um, Hi, Joel. I just um, really want to thank you for being here. It's been very informative for me. But um, there's... Three, um, three questions I have for you. The first is maybe if you could talk a little bit about what you think is happening in Syria. Um, second, how do we support the persecuted Christians in the Middle East who are really struggling and suffering? Like, you know, what do you think the best way to do that is? And then thirdly, I had an encounter um, with 
a Muslim cab driver in DC several years ago. And it was an interesting conversation, to your point, very open. We were having this philosophical conversation about the differences between a Muslim worldview and a Christian worldview. And he had an advanced degree, I can't remember what country he was from, but he was super articulate, super intelligent, married to an American, he had three kids. But the, the, the culmination of this conversation was that you know, his, his answer for the sin problem is the purging the earth, essentially, of all of the spiritual contamination. And I'm, these are my words, you know, but, but that meant that even if it was his wife and his kids, then, you know, it would be for Allah if they died for Allah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? And this was before 9-11. Um, you know, and, and the thing that really scared me was that, like, he was so rational, he was so zealous, so sincere, but he really believed that even if it meant the death of his own kids, he could, he, that would be fine. And, um, and then I was in London um, just a couple of years ago, and I happened to be there on Sunday at Hyde Park, at, you know, Hyde Park for um, Speaker's Corner, and the Muslims had a table laid out there with tracks, and, um, you know, the, one of them caught my eye, and it said, Allah is a God of love. So I got into a conversation with the imam there, and I relayed this cab driver thing, and I said, could you explain this to me? You know, like, how does this fit theologically? And he would not renounce that stuff at all. You know, I mean, it was just like very... The, the, the interesting thing was that the young guy that I talked to behind the table later on, we had a great conversation about how they think Jesus is coming back again, and it was to your point about just a really nice exchange. But I was very chilled by the... the um, the passion that this guy had and the intelligence that he had, and it just felt like that mindset is so close. Like, that's the solution for the sin problem. And maybe if you could, I don't know that we would have conversations like that now after 9-11 quite so openly, right. but, you know, it was chilling nonetheless. Yeah. I used to uh, dialogue with this um, doctor from Egypt, and he was real incredibly intelligent, articulate, and, <laughs> and he, he basically said the same thing, like, when the time comes there's going to be, you know, sort of a purge. And I said, well, since we're friends, will you at least give me morphine before you behead me? He said, because we're friends. Um, so I was like, great. Um, I was just kidding. I don't plan on getting IV'd before I get beheaded. Um, I want to feel it. No, just kidding. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, what's going on in Syria? That's kind of a uh, complicated issue. I believe that the current landscape in the Middle East is aligning with the landscape as described by the biblical prophets in a profound way. It's coming into amazing focus. That would take all night to explain. Um, what's unfolding in the Middle East is pretty profound. Um, how can we support Christians in the Middle East? Um, I'll just say this. Um, uh, the best way is to talk to your pastor and see if there's anything that's, you know, an in, 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 initiative through the church. Um, you know, and do that, and if not, encourage them to get something going. Um, you know, if, if you don't, you come up with dead ends there, I do, if you go to my website, I, I work with GCM, that's the, that's the ministry that's in Iran, and um, the other one is FAI, which is doing ministry in Syria and Iraq, and uh, those two, I'm, I'm on the board of both, and, but I don't want to solicit funds for different ministry here, so the first thing is I go to your pastor and see if that's there. Um, yeah, I won't comment. I mean, you know, not all Muslims are like that. Like, they're not like they're thinking we're going to eventually, you know, kill all the pagans and the infidels. But we hear that and we kind of get chilled. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here and, and kind of say a lot of Christians, if you talk to Christians, like um, how many years ago was that um, abortion doctor shot in church out in Kansas? That was Kansas, wasn't it? To a degree, a lot of Christians go uh, on social media, they're like, we renounce murder. And they go deep inside, they're like, yeah, but that SOB got what he deserved. We kind of do. And um, sometimes Muslims are kind of like that. Like, we go, yeah, but you're all secretly supporting the jihadis. But sometimes we're not greatly different. Like, we go, well, when Jesus comes back, he's going to execute vengeance on the wicked. You know, it's just our idea of the wicked is different than theirs. And so I'm not trying to make moral equivalents because it's really not quite the same, but it's not necessarily as completely radically different as some of what we believe. Um, it's just the difference is we are waiting 
a divine God-man to burst forth from heaven to execute God's righteous judgments. Muslims actually believe that they will participate, not actually participate, but actually do it themselves. So it's aggressive, it's active, as opposed to our picture, which is defensive, and, and we're passively awaiting our defender to come. They're like saying, hey, we don't wait for the, the, their Messiah figure known as the Mahdi. We don't wait for him. We start doing this stuff now. So there is some significant differences, but by the same token, I'm just saying, don't think that every Muslim is pure evil in their mindset. No, but you know what I mean? Like, cause, but sometimes, so um, anyway, those are just a couple thoughts. I don't know how helpful it is. Joel back here. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's okay. So, uh, so uh, first of all, thank you. I mean, this is, was amazing and just totally what the Holy Spirit needed, I, I think, us to hear, at least me personally to hear. This was uh, really but just very powerful. Um, I, for a while, just had a heart for the people, mainly men, that I've met that are Muslim uh, around the greater New York area, and some of them may be just someone that drove my wife to the airport the other day. Um, someone was my mechanic uh, that, uh, you know, at one point it was in my old neighborhood, and we got a little bit of a conversation going, and I realized that he believed in the Bible but didn't have one. And so it was, the, the, one of the last parting things I did before moving from the neighborhood was just give him a really nice, beautiful one. I yeah. said, so you got to put this next to your Quran and you got to read it. Um, but there's two things, well, first of all, can you give some advice as far as the friendship witnessing evangelism, if you will, to someone to just, I mean, I just love their, when, when you meet a, a, a a beautiful Muslim person, and, when, and I use the word beautiful in the sense that they're, there's a gregariousness about them, there's a, a joy about them, they are family, and they like to, there, there's just a relational aspect that seems very endearing to me and to anyone that if you actually, you know, it seems like you want to sit around a table and eat, it's kind of the way you discussed it, so if you give us some more tips towards how we do that, number one, and then the second question or thought was also, um, and it was, I'm sorry, it was more a specific question. I know when you talk about Jewish people who believe in Christ, we refer to them as um, Messianic Jews. Yeah. Uh, do we still refer to, like, uh, what's the actual proper term, if you will, for a believer in Christ who is a raised Muslim? Because Muslims more, I don't know, is, is it Muslim Jew or is it something else? So, thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely not Muslim Jew. Um, <laughs> so, um, let me just do four things. Four things everyone can do is love them. And what that means is make friends with them, invite them over for dinner, go out to eat, get to know them, ask questions. Pretty simple, anyone can do that. Love them, become friends with them. Two, find out as you make friends with them what their prayer needs are. Three, pray for them. Don't just find out, okay, cool, pray for you, go, be warm, be safe. No, pray for them. Because that says that you actually believe the Holy Spirit's real and he does any, and that's what he does. If you have the opportunity, if they're actually got some, you know, something, can I lay hands on you and pray for you? Ask for the, say, Jesus laid hands on the sick. Pray for um, them. Four, give them the scriptures. Oh, actually, five. Five things. Well, I guess I'm mixing, I'm mixing love them with uh, pray for them. But the five is get trained. Get trained. If you want to learn apologetics to Islam, um, there's a website called The Wadi. W-A-D-I. It's on my website. Um, I've got sort of this slider that has the different ministries I partner with. The Wadi is like hundreds of hours of some of the best classes in the world, free, online, every issue you can imagine, women's cultural issues, Middle Eastern cultural issues, apologetics, street preaching, you name it, free classes. So that's the last thing. If you really want to go there, get trained, learn apologetics. But again, I put that last. Those are the basic things. Um, Jews, when they become... A believer in Jesus, they don't leave Judaism. They might leave rabbinic modern day Judaism, but they remain Jewish, which is both an ethnic and a religious thing. They don't renounce their Judaism. They have become a fulfilled Jew. Muslims are called to renounce the deeds of darkness and the deception of the false prophet and, and so forth. So they don't, usually what um, Muslims, we call Muslims is Muslim background believer. Not all Muslim background believers like to be called MBBs, um, you know, so, and, and there are some Muslims, by the way, because, you know, depending on where you are, a lot of Muslims, like in Egypt right now, there's a huge movement of, of Egyptian Muslims becoming atheists. 
They'll still call themselves Muslims, cultural Muslims, but they go, but I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. So they still identify with their family, their heritage, and their culture as saying, well, we're Muslim, but I've rejected the religious side of it. So there are some Muslims that become believers, they'll say, I'm a Muslim follower of Jesus. I'm not a huge fan of that language because I think it can blur and confuse things, especially in today's kind of ecumenical, syncretistic, let's just do sort of a little bit of both, you know, kind of stuff. So, you know, usually the term you'll hear is Muslim background believer, Christian, you know, something like that. So um, this will be the last one. And if, if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, I'm around, but then we'll, we'll dismiss after this question. Hello? Oh. Oh, hi, Joel. Thank you so much for being here. Greatly appreciate it. I saw the movie Silence. I don't know if you saw it. I did. Um, and it disturbed me for weeks afterwards. And for those who don't know, it was um, uh, Catholic missionaries that went into Japan and attempt to evangelize Japan. And, and the um, government was so vicious and brutal in the torture of anyone who became a Christian that they basically, to this day, only 5% of the population is Christian from that effort. And my question is, you were saying that Muslims will exceed Christianity, number of Christians by 2050, I think it was. Is it because of the lack of the presence in those world, in that area that allows us to continue to grow? Or is there something else? And, and then what is that something else and what can we do? You know? Yeah, that movie, I didn't like it. Um, it's a combination of many things. One is the lukewarm nature of the church. We're not actually making disciples. We're not actually obedient to Jesus. Um, the Islamic world is growing primarily because of birth rates, because there's a simple principle, which is to say the future belongs to those who show up for it. And we in the West are essentially aborting ourselves into non-existence. And, um, you know, Western Europe is, you know, sort of the stereotypical 50-year-old man still living at home with mom, you know, disco, disco. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we don't have kids until we're 34, and then we have the one or two. You know, that kind of thing is trending. Meanwhile, Osama bin Laden was the 52nd child of his father. So demographics, when you go there, shift quickly. Um, but, you know, then there's the issue of conversions and so forth. So there's many, many factors that go into all of this. Um, and demographic trends can also shift rapidly. You know, the economy collapses all of a sudden, the birth rate just plummets, things like that, different nations. Nations like Iran, um, there's an incredible, um, uh, incredible lack of hope. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Iran has one of the highest drug addiction rates in the world, one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, tremendous number of women are in prostitution, and that's always the sign of lack of hope for the future. Um, and, you know, so a lot of that is because of the economy, the American sanctions and different things, again, which is because ultimately the regime is doing everything they can to stay in power. But there's other nations, like even Turkey, uh, the birth rates are uh, not doing well. That's why the President Erdogan of Turkey has been, like, almost demanding that his people have two or three kids at least um, or more. Because they, people understand the future belongs to those who show up for it. But still, by and large, the, the Muslim world is simply growing faster. But in terms of conversions, I don't know who's winning that one. But, you know, in the United States, there's still tens of thousands of Americans that are converting. Let me just give you an example. Did I hear a British accent a little bit? No? no? Not even a teeny bit? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, no, just kidding. So, um, uh, you and Madonna and um, what's, who was um, the other guy? Anyway, I'm just kidding with you, I'm sorry. Um, you know, whenever you're on the pulpit, never pick on anyone because you're in this place of power. Um, I once, I once, I, uh, this guy was, uh, I did this whole message and then it was kind of like that thing, he raised his hand and asked a question, which was like, I was like, did you not hear a word I just said? And I, I asked him, I said, do you have narcolepsy? And I was like, oh, like as soon as it came out, I was like, I have to apologize. That guy. Um, <laughs> narcolepsy is when you just fall asleep and you see. So um, what was the question? No, wait. No. Um, oh, something about, okay, the UK. So think of this. Um, in the UK presently, I forget the number. What's the number uh, population of the Great Britain? Is it like 60 million? 60 million, a country that was originally considered to be a Christian nation, God save the queen, the whole thing. And um, 
you have roughly, and these, these numbers might be a few years old, roughly three, 4,000 former Muslims that have become Christians. Um, but close to like 150,000 Brits that have converted to Islam. So of the, you know, couple million Muslim immigrants, they've managed to, this small little number has managed to destroy us in terms of conversions. In the United States, there's a lot of different factors. Um, in the prisons, Islam is exploding. We can get into the whole thing with, you know, there's just a lot there in terms of um, multiple trends that are happening. I I'm a, come from a transracial family, so I, I um, think a lot about some of these issues. But, you know, in the African-American community, through a combination, again, of all sorts of factors, we're now roughly at about 70% uh, children are born without a dad. So you have that father wound, you have that sort of thing. Islam is the spirit of abandonment. Um, Ishmael was abandoned by, and not a, he was kicked out of the camp by uh, Abraham. He was abandoned. He had this incredible wound. Muhammad himself, his father died when his mother was pregnant. Then she died when he was a baby. He was raised by his grandfather. He died. He had these multiple um, father wounds, and, and I believe Satan used that spirit, and now Satan is exploiting that spirit in you know, and that's the negative side of it. Then there's the other side of it, and I'll say a little bit about which is not quite the same, but, you know, Farrakhanism and, and all this kind of stuff is a lot of times the, the mosques are doing a lot in the more of the urban core in terms of, you know, I was the quintessential loser, so I can, you know, um, I always say I learned how to become a preacher because I was such a loser. The bigger loser you are, the more that you learn how to tell stories to make your loser life sound legendary. Oh, you did that? That's nothing, dude. You should hear this. Have you met my friend Tim? He lives in the basement with his grandmother. Um, oh, you know, you learn how to tell stories. Well, you're, you're this prime candidate. So when you have, you know, uh, somebody in the urban core, they don't have much going, and someone comes and they say, put on the religious garment. Here is instant dignity, the rush of religious religiosity, but yet it doesn't come with the cross because you can still cuss, you can still, you know, embrace a lot of different forms of, of, of hatred. I mean, even look at ISIS. I mean, they're raping and they still have the religious spirit. So there's a carnality to it, but so there's just a combination of factors. And what I was going to say is so oftentimes a lot of the mosques and Farrakhan, a lot of, they're doing a lot in the urban core in the way of, um, you know, or development and, um, and, and uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Yeah, outreach, but, but not just outreach, like real practical things. This is what Hamas does and, and so forth. And oftentimes the churches are failing because a lot of the churches in the, are just fiending over their little fiefdoms and kingdoms. And so, so there's a lot of issues about our failures and they're wise in some things. So there's just multiple, multiple dynamics. Um, then there's always just the issue of the, you know, going away to college and she meets this um, you know, good-looking, swarthy, rich, Saudi, you know, guy who's super moderate, you know, and that whole kind of story. And 70% um, of, of Western marriages, which then result in conversion to Islam, 70% of the marriages fail. And 70% of the women that convert to Islam because of marriage leave Islam later. So it's 70, 70, 70. Um, yeah, it's good that a lot leave, but then there's kids and there's all kinds of stuff involved. And, you know, I, I constantly run into women. They're like, my children are Muslims. You know, I was raised a Christian. I married this guy in college. My kids are Muslims. One of my kids got saved. The other two, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so there's just a lot of different factors, and we can't think that there's one simple answer. Muslims, by the way, what they do, and, and, and this is why I, I kind of like... Like, I, I get a little bit defensive when I, I hear, you know, America bashing, because what Muslims do, and I've seen this a million times, and this goes back to, you know, before 9-11. Before 9-11, it was the Wild West on the Internet in terms of things that they would say. Like, people don't say that stuff as much anymore. But what they do is they tear down. 
They tear down, tear down, tear down, tear down. And anyone can tear down. It's easy to tear down. So what they do is they come and they go, oh, so you're a Christian. So doesn't the Bible, you know, you, you say, oh, it's bad that I wear a hijab. Well, I mean, do you think Mary didn't wear a head covering? You know, doesn't Paul talk about head coverings? And you guys say, oh, well, I mean, isn't modesty like a, a, a concept that the Bible teaches? Oh, look at this picture. Isn't this like one of the most popular Christian musicians? Do you call that modest? Um, is that how you want your daughters to dress? You know, and they, they just tear down to, and then they associate all Christianity with the United States. Oh, so George Bush and Madonna, like, I mean, they're Christians, you know, they, well, you know what I'm saying, like, everything that we do around the world is Christianity, and they, they do that, and they just tear down, tear down, tear down, and then they offer the track that um, Sister was talking about, which says, Allah is love, then they offer a decaffeinated Islam light, a Christianized version of Islam, which is not known in the Middle East, um, in, the, in the Allah is love, well, he, um, that is a Christianized version of Islam. And you go, oh, this is pretty much just like Christianity. It's just a little bit more biblical. It's a little bit more exotic, a little more Middle Eastern. You go, they're right. We're hypocrites. You know? And the truth is, we are all hypocrites. And so are they. You know? And then women go, yeah, I, um, I, I, you, know, you say the hijab is demeaning, blah, blah, blah. But um, I'm sick of being treated like an object and judged by my form, this and that. I'm put on the hijab. I'm taking myself off the meat market. Now I am cherished. Now I am covered. Now I am protected. And they have the arguments, and it sounds good. The problem is once they enter that world, they find out there's, there's, sin doesn't disappear. Sin is everywhere. And in fact, the Quran says, um, oh, I'm, how, I wanna, I'm gonna misquote it. But it basically says, like, you husbands have control over your wives because you are superior to them. <laughs> you know, like, it says, um, there's one hadith, this tradition, which says, um, essentially, the testimony of a woman is only, uh, well, I don't know if it's a hadith or if it's sort of a, a, within Islamic jurisprudence, like a ruling. Um, the testimony of a woman is only half as good of a man in court. So you need two women to equal one man. And then it says, because they are deficient in knowledge. <laughs> you know, like, okay, like, let's just, I don't care if you're a flaming liberal or a raging conservative, we can all agree that's evil. Our system of laws, superior, better. And, you know, so there is a degree to where we need to reclaim a sense of cultural superiority. As soon as you say that, everyone hears racial superiority. And, like, everything in us just recoils. It's not about, it has nothing to do with race. It has to do with principles that are better than Sharia law, et cetera, et cetera. And say, yes, we fall short of these principles, but they are great. Equality, civil liberties, freedom, and all these things are worth being proud of and aspiring to and saying they're better. So as, I think it was... Thatcher, was it Ch Ch Churchill or Margaret Thatcher? I don't know, one of them said, democracy is um, the worst form of government except for every other one. Churchill? Churchill. So the point is, like, this system is not ideal, but for now it's the best we have until Jesus returns. And it's popular to tear down, you know, because we are part of a, and I'm going to end it now, part of the Christian culture, which means we're confessional, which means we confess our sins, confess our weaknesses. The Islamic world doesn't do that. They don't confess their weaknesses. They, don't, they, they blow a plane out of the, build, the sky. They don't go, well, I'm sorry. Like, even though everyone knows they did it, they never say, we're just like stumbling over ourselves to apologize. And this culture of like feeling bad about who we are, we've been hamstrung by education for so long that just says like, all cultures are equal. In fact, ours is probably not as good. And you know what I mean? Like, and there's things about Middle Eastern culture, like hospitality and all those things are great. But when it comes to the founding principles, uh, we have to say it's actually superior to Islamic law and that system of government and the religious system that it's enshrouded in. So we need to reclaim, because what happens is you have these two cultures that are clashing. One is incredibly confident. They believe that it's their God-given destiny to take over the world. And we're all like, we're so sorry. And they, and they just run in right over us. So it's a bad combination. I've talked 15 minutes longer than I said I would. So amen and amen.